Becky, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really interested in hearing your story. Obviously, it's quite a devastating um, thing that you've been through. I'm just yeah. wondering, initially, what were your early life, um, your earlier relationships like before you met this man? Uh, well, when I was younger, when I was about 16, I um, was with a lad the same age as me for a couple of years. We stayed best friends for many years afterwards. It was a really, like, what you would call, I guess, normal, healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of outgrew each other in that sense after a couple of years, between 16 and 18. And we stayed best of friends for years after that. Um, and yeah, I think I would say then I was with someone while I was at college and that was pretty standard. Just, you know, your sort of first heartbreak, normal sort of thing and nothing untoward there. Um, I had um, when I had my oldest son, Jack, um, myself and his dad both worked as performers um, and that really I mean, we're still friends to this day. That just, um, it just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. So we decided to be friends who raised our child together rather than trying to stay together in something that wasn't working. Yeah. Um, then I had my son, Charlie, and unfortunately that didn't work out very well with his dad. So after four years, we separated. Um, his dad did take things um, through the family courts and things and then later used the abuse that I went through against me and family court. Um, so that kind of complicated that far more than it ever should have been. Should have been. Mm. But um, definitely I had never experienced anything at all on the level that I next went into in that phase of life. Yeah. So, what, was the, um, what was it like when you first met him? What were the early stages of the romance like? So the way we met was I used to run my own theatre school um, in Northamptonshire and I had a young lady come to me um, who was had always been a ballet dancer but she wanted to do more musical theatre work. Um, I do teach ballet but ballet is certainly not my you know main arena mm -hmm. so um, to be able to support her ballet to the extent that she needed it to go to ballet college I looked into hiring a ballet teacher. And literally the day, I was actually talking to her about this the other day, the day that um, I went to put an advert in the local dance shop, as I was getting dressed, the phone rang and I ran downstairs and answered the phone and somebody said, hello, is that Foley's dance school? And I said, oh, it's Foley's theatre school, yes. And I remember it because he mispronounced um, the name of the school. And he mm -hmm. said, do you teach ballet? So I naturally thought it was an inquiry and said, this is what we do and we do these subjects, etc." And he said, I'm not actually a parent, I'm a ballet dancer and I'm looking for teaching work in Northampton. So I said, your ears must have been burning. I'm just on my way to find a ballet teacher. So that night, some of my pupils were performing at um, one of the local schools. So I said, why don't you come down and watch, send me your CV and your resume. Um, he had worked for the English National Ballet when he was younger, um, had been in their college and their company. He had received um, a scholarship when he was a teenager to go and study in Russia. He was a very talented dancer mm -hmm. um, and at the time was teaching at one of the more prestigious schools in Northampton, at the yeah. boys' school. So we had a chat when we went to see the performance that night um, and I said, look, let's have another chat one day. Let's see what you can do. And he came to work for me as a teacher. That's how we met. Yeah. So we worked together initially, yeah. um, him working for me. What happened? So where that ended up sort of starting to turn into a romance. So what were the early kind of stages of him maybe trying to woo you? So really, um, as I said, I was going through um, a breakup with Charlie's dad. Now our situation really, if I'm honest, by the, after the first year, we ended up just sort of living together for the next three years. There was not really a relationship in the true sense of the word, yeah. but it just kind of carried on because we had the kids there, we had work and you just kind of trundled through each day. Um, and as we were going through that breakup, it was a few months into Stephen working for me. Um, Charlie's dad just started to act a bit strange because you know it was getting to the point of, well, you need to move out. And it was just starting to get not very nice, I guess. And uh, Stephen said, you know, I'll help you. I'll come help move the stuff, anything you need, I'm there. And it kind of started in the sense that I was in a bit of a vulnerable place and he was there like the knight in shining armor mm. to pick up the pieces. That's so very really, helpful initially. Very helpful, overly helpful. Mm -hmm. If I had to go and teach a lesson, 
he would offer to drive me to the lesson so I didn't have to get a bus or a cab and he would offer to pick me up and anything I needed moving around anything at all he was there on call should I need him Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and that one must have felt really good for you at that point in your life because you needed someone that you could rely on and it was probably a relief after what you'd been through with Charlie's Yeah, dad. I think by that point, um, although there was no abuse in the, those previous two relationships with Jack and Charlie's dads, the idea of a fairy tale happy ever after had disappeared mm -hmm. into the background. Yeah, And um, I was feeling, I guess, if I'm honest, probably like, well, now I've got two children with two different people. No one's going to want to be with me. And what do I do now? Mm -hmm. I, I was independent in the sense that, yes, I ran my business and I could look after my children. But there was it never felt for a long time like I had anyone there for me. Yeah, yeah. But obviously my family, but I mean, like, as not I probably even as a close close friend I probably didn't have that for quite a long time mm. um so yeah. yeah it was nice to have that yeah and it must have felt really good and and also that and it, it was all you know and then of course when any sign of romance started it was very you know very much oh over, over the top almost like romantic gestures and um mm -hmm. you know I, I, he told me he couldn't have children and that the children weren't a problem because he couldn't have children himself. So he'd always wanted children, so that wouldn't be an issue. He would see them as his own. And and of course, those are things when I was feeling the way I was feeling at that moment in time were everything that I guess I wanted to hear. Yeah. And more. What a safety. Um, like, he must have given you so much safety in your life. Like you've got this reliable man. He doesn't mind that you've got two children. He doesn't even need children himself. So he's like, your, your situation is perfect. And he's so helpful and you can rely on him. And you've just come out of yeah, a situation. We together. He understood um, what I did for a living, which can be quite hard sometimes as a performer. If you're with someone who isn't in that industry, mm -hmm. um, it can be quite a hard one to get your head around because it's strange hours and we're quite, sort of passionate out there people and um people can get quite insecure being around that mm -hmm. um rightly or wrongly it, it can happen um and obviously if we go on tours or things like that the person who's home has to understand that lifestyle yeah so to have someone who had done that himself obviously on the flip side of the entertainment industry but had done that had been there that seemed again you know well we've got so much in common mm. and we understand one another and we've been working together and yeah, yeah. he was ticking, ticking every box and he was attractive as well. Yeah, he was. He was a really handsome guy. Um, he was physically fit because of obviously the dance inside of things. Um, and bizarrely, I mean, for me, like looks have never been at the top of my list of things because I always think, well, looks wear out and it's mm. the other stuff that stays. Of course, it's nice if someone attractive thinks you're attractive and yeah. they are ticking all the boxes of course it's you're not going to complain about yeah it. and of course he was teaching so when you work as a teacher you tend to assume again rightly or wrongly that someone has um the ability to care for people more vulnerable than them mm -hmm. and to um to you know coach them in certain ways and bring out the best in them and mm. so all of those things were very appealing to me yeah so yeah, and he was at all the boxes and more at the time. Yeah. What were the early red flags for you that you, you didn't see at the time? It's a very strange thing looking back on it because things that I say I didn't see at the time, I may have had strange feelings about. Mm -hmm. Yep. There was a, a strange kind of gut instinct sometimes that, oh, that feels a bit odd. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't put my finger on why. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the things was a couple of months into, we'd had this sort of the summer break and we put on a summer school for our pupils and I'd gone through the breakup and I'd moved house and the whole sort of love bombing had occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and the next thing was he wanted to get married. He said, you know, no one's ever been there to look after you in that way. I want to do this. I, I'm someone you can rely on. And so I, you know, again, it was like, wow, okay, this is, an appealing thing and it was all put there as this most romantic gesture um, of someone who completely was just in love with you mm -hmm. um, and he was in quite a rush to do it that was the thing I remember but the way mm -hmm. he put it at the time was that 
he knew that it had always been quite important to me that if I ever got married that my nan was at my wedding mm -hmm. and she was getting quite elderly and she'd started to get dementia and he said look let's do it while my granddad and your nan are still around yeah and again that was something that was like okay yeah well although it feels strange to do it quickly it also kind of makes sense it, uh, that I understand why he's saying that for mm -hmm. me um so how soon I in did, was that so we started seeing each other, I th this is a long time ago, I think it was like in the June, we started showing interest. We got married on the 2nd of September. Yeah. Um, and what had actually happened was during summer school, I was teaching and he was out and he came into the summer school and said, I've booked the wedding date. But he did it as a surprise and it was for three weeks later. Was so, that, was that, did that, that seem a bit too soon for you? It seems like, whoa, that's quick. And I said, why don't we wait a little bit? And he said, well, look, once we get back into teaching in September, you know how the year goes. It's gone before we know it. Um, so let's just do it now. Um, everyone can be there before we get back into teaching properly. Your nan can be there. My granddad can be there. Mm -hmm. And it's done. Mm -hmm. Very and again, persuasive. Although I Yes, I had that feeling of, oh, it's very quick. But again, because it's put as a romantic gesture, it's easy to let your heart rule rather than your head. Yeah. Um, so we, it was done so quickly that we had our wedding day on one day and our reception was two weeks later because of the way we were trying to work out how we could make it all happen. Yeah. Um, so then we got married and the day of our wedding, he started acting a bit strange a couple of days before. And I think I... Oh, I forgot one of the key things. Four days before getting married, I found out I was pregnant. Right. And um, I did loads of tests because I was like, you said you couldn't have children, but here we go. And I wasn't upset about that because if I love children. I would have had a bigger house full of children if I could have. Um, but he lied. Said, yeah. But when I questioned it, he was like, I'd been told I couldn't have children. But I guess, again, I remember thinking, when I was younger, I had polycystic ovaries, and I was told I may not ever have children. Mm -hmm. I've now got five children, so that <laughs> didn't yeah, yeah. work out that way. So I just kind of made it into this, wow, we'd both been told we couldn't have children, and look how wonderful. Um, we got married four days later, and I remember the night before, he was acting a bit strange, to the point where I thought, he's not going to turn up tomorrow. Wow. But he did. So then I thought, oh, it's just me getting nervous. Mm -hmm. So you're and picking up on something not being right, but you just didn't know yeah, what it was. I didn't know what. I couldn't put my finger on any one particular thing at the time. Um, we went for the dinner with our family and friends because it was just family and friends at the wedding. And before we went for the dinner, he said to me, we're going to sit for the toast, but I've got a surprise for you. So we can't stay for the meal. So I was like, it's the wedding meal. What do you mm. mean we can't stay? And no, there's a surprise in store. Um, so I was like, okay, so I don't know any different. Okay, then. And I remember my family being like, you're not staying for the food. And I was like, no, apparently there's somewhere we've got to go. It's this big surprise. So we go off to this sort of haunted hotel in this village somewhere for the night. And uh, we ate fish and chips. And then we both fell asleep because we were so exhausted from the day. And the next morning, he got up and started getting ready to go to breakfast without me. And I thought, that's a bit odd. So I go down to breakfast. He's already sitting eating. And I made a joke about, well, that was a romantic wedding night, wasn't it? Fish and chips and fall asleep. And he just lost his temper and walked out. And wow. I thought, okay. And I tried to go out and speak to him. And the next thing I knew, he packed his stuff. And I went to go to the car. And he drove off and left me in the car park. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I thought, what is going on? So I've just found out five days beforehand I'm pregnant. We got married yesterday, and now he's driving off and leaving me. Mm. He came back and got me, and when we were driving along, um, he started saying things like, well, it's all downhill from here. Wow. And I remember thinking, what have I got into? Yeah. At that point, I was now pregnant and married, and I remember thinking, I can't tell anyone because I'm super embarrassed. Mm. That was my initial thought. Yeah, you must have felt so much shame and embarrassment over what was unfolding at that point that this charming man had just miraculously turned into someone that was not nice at all. Like, instantly. And that day we went to the hospital because I was getting pains in my tummy. And um, they thought at first I might be having an ectopic pregnancy. Mm. And they said, you need to come back in a couple of days. 
um, have you ever been told you've got a split uterus? And I was like, no. So I go back a couple of days later and uh, we find out I'm having twins. So not only am I pregnant, but I'm now having two more children. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that doubles obviously the pressure on everything. Then we had our reception. When we approached the reception, he said to me, I don't think I'm going to come in tonight. Wow. wow. And I was like, it's our wedding reception. What do you mean you're not coming in? And he did eventually come in, but he just like used to cause this strain all the time to keep you on edge. Mm -hmm. That's what it ended up being was, well, I don't know if I'm going to do this. I don't know if I'm going to do that. And I've got a photograph that I actually use when I do trainings for mm -hmm. domestic abuse, especially with the police um, in regards to coercive control. Yeah. And it's the photograph of me and him cutting our cake mm -hmm. and I'm smiling and he's got a really strange look on his face. And it's because at that point he is whispering in my ear, when we've cut the cake, I'm leaving. Wow. And then he disappeared out for about an hour and a half. No one could find him. And when he came back, he'd got changed out of his morning suit and just put shorts and t-shirt on to come back into the reception. My God. And everyone was like, what's he doing? Where's he been? What's he been doing? And no one could really understand it, but no one wanted to say anything because yeah. everyone was at a wedding reception. So it was kind of this big elephant in the room. Mm. Um, Do you remember the emotions that you would feel in those kind of situations? Because on one hand, it sounds incredibly confusing. Um, and, and also, it, it sounds like you would have had to try to almost battle off a lot of emotions through trying to think that, no, this can be okay. Like, this is there's an explanation yeah. for all of this. <laughs> you kind of have this strange feeling of, I don't know what's going on because he wasn't being outwardly abusive. He wasn't calling me names. He was just acting really strangely. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, I've just got to put a face on. It's my wedding reception. Everyone's come here from a long way away mm -hmm. and they expect it to be this special day. So that's what I have to make it. And it was keeping up appearances. And I guess that became the beginning of what, would transpire over a long time. Do you um, appearances. do you know what his motive was in terms of wanting to get married um, so quickly? Was there a financial motive there? Uh, very quickly after getting married, he made a comment about how I should be giving him half of the dance school um, because we were now married. And then when I was going through um, the family court for contact with Charlie, he got very irate one day when he was not given a say in the family court mm -hmm. because he was now married to me, so he should get to decide what happens. And, of course, that's not how it works. Um, and as the solicitor left the room, he started getting angry at me because he didn't have the say he thought he was going to have. Mm -hmm. So I can only speculate over the years that it was partly to do with work, partly to do with control and maybe a mixture of other things in between. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll never really know, but there was a huge element of control there. Yeah, yeah, that, that actually that him marrying you so fast is part of getting control over you and your life. Yeah. And that was on every level, including financial, emotional, your behavior, what yeah. you got to do, what you didn't. Yeah, um, there would be small things like he, he would convince me that while this family court case was going on, you shouldn't... I used to always have Jack's dad come over at the weekend to play with Jack, and we got on fine. So mm -hmm. even if I was teaching, I would let him into the home. He could play with Jack in the home. I had no problem with that. I felt that it kept it normal, and it gave them somewhere safe to be and play, especially when the weather was bad. Um, and he tried to twist that into I was mixing my children up, and I should have someone come to the door, drop them off, and then go. No one was to cross the threshold anymore. Mm, um, be because it was too confusing to them. They didn't know who was who and I shouldn't be friends with these people. I, it was detrimental to my children and I was acting in a way that was detrimental to my children. Um, mm. Which I remember initially thinking that's not what it is and then gradually drip, 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 thinking, well, maybe, maybe it might be easier if I just have everyone drop off and pick up and mm. it won't cause problems. Um, and one day he punched... We had a staircase that came up over into our lounge um, and he lost his temper about it one day and punched the staircase and busted his knuckle. 
And I remember his mum asking a few days later, what did you do to your hand? And he lied in front of me and said, oh, I did such and such. And I remember thinking, why would you lie? Mm. And that was a moment, definitely, because I thought, if I had got angry at something, I'd say to my mum, oh, I got angry and I lost my temper and I was stupid. And, yeah. But the whole cover-up, I remember that concerning me mm -hmm. because I thought, that's not what happened. And you're saying it in front of me, you don't care that you're lying. Yeah. His parents then, something was said about when we had the scan done of the twins and I said, oh, isn't it funny like that we ended up both being told we couldn't have children and then we're having twins. And they said, when was he told he couldn't have children? And again, that was a moment where I kind of went, oh, okay. Yeah. Like little light bulb moments, but feeling that, by that point I was in and um, maybe it was strange but it wasn't something we couldn't deal with there was that feeling as well and I think that's like a weird survival instinct mm -hmm. of well if I can just normalize something I can cope with it yeah yeah that it was too devastating to at that point be able to come to terms with he's not he you know he's, he's been lying he's not the man that you thought he was and it's easier to kind of make excuses for the behavior and, and kind of accept yeah. it and think that, no, it's okay. It's that's, that's all right. I can put that to I one side. That and I can put that to one side. Yeah. Like you say, and it's, and they're small things at the time. So, um, many times when I've spoken to people about this, they say to me, why would you marry someone like that? Cause of course they hear the story as it is now. Yeah. Why well, didn't go on the first date with someone and then punch me in the face? Because I certainly would never have gone on a second of course, date. Though. Of course. He was charming and kind and everything that you needed yes. to reel you in initially. Yeah. And you also, you accept that people have their, you know, everyone has their strange little quirks and things that, you know, bug them and things that some what one person is good with someone else isn't good with mm -hmm. so when you're in the new relationship and that initial couple of months is gone and you start to settle into what is going to be normal for the two of you you kind of find some of these things and think oh well maybe it's just me overreacting to it mm -hmm. maybe I'm reading too much into it and they also if you try to confront it that's what you're told no you're reading too much into it yeah you're being paranoid yeah you're thinking of it too much um, mm -hmm. this went on and things started to come up about, you know, gradually he would make issues about things to do with my family. He didn't want my family around as much. So he'd already pushed the boys' dads out of the equation, their families out of the equation. Um, he was taken over more and more at the dance school, which was easy to do because as I was getting more pregnant, I was extremely sick with the twins. Mm -hmm. um, I was in and out of hospital with high premises constantly. Um, eventually... At Christmas, Charlie was due to have his first proper Christmas contact with his dad. And we'd arranged that Christmas Day he was with me and Boxing Day he would be with his dad. So we dropped him off. Everything was fine. Um, we go to his parents' place, Stephen's parents' place, and have a nice day. We go later that evening to pick Charlie up, and it was snowing. And we're going through the villages in Northampton. And as we go to pick Charlie up, Paul brings him out. And he was only two at the time. Yeah. Um, maybe just turned three actually and he goes to hand him to me and as he does he said oh Charlie got this ring from a cracker he won't let go of it he's obsessed with it so he goes to hand him to me and Charlie goes to drop the ring so Paul goes to grab it like this like here and um, I said right give daddy a kiss goodbye we'll see him soon and um, I said thanks for having him today um, we'll sit you know just saying other goodbyes I got into the car put Charlie in the car the door shuts and suddenly Stephen screeches away on the icy road. And I remember thinking, what on earth? I've got the child in the car, mm. I'm pregnant, what's he doing? You could, you're a whore, you're a slut. You let him put his hand near your chest because he'd gone to catch the ring. Mm. You leant over to let Charlie kiss him while you were holding him. And it just became this like barrage of abuse and me holding the seat all the way home thinking he's going to crash. We pull up at his parents and I think now, right, if we go in, he's going to stop. He didn't stop in front of his whole family. He stomped around the house. I sat on the kitchen floor with my child on my lap, pregnant. And he literally shouted, what a whore and a slut I was, how um, I was wearing a maternity top. But if you looked through under certain lights, you could see through it. Um, 
and his family were saying, well, Stephen, what are you doing? What are you saying this for? But nobody stopped him. Mm. They all wow. just stood and allowed it to happen. Wow. And I was crying and they sent me home with him that night. Nobody offered to make him stay there. Nobody offered to come with me. Wow. They just said, you'll be fine. Put the kids in the car. It'll be okay. And I learned at that moment, I'm not going to get any support here. Mm -hmm. um, not mm. in the way I need it. And mm. my family lived in Essex. I was in Northampton. So there was distance from us. Mm -hmm. um, I then went into early labor in the February. We moved house. Um, and I went into premature labor. I was... Um, I ended up being in early labor. They kept trying to keep the labor off for 10 days. So for five days, I contracted every five minutes. For five days, I contracted every two minutes. And eventually, the labor really set in, and they said, right, you've got to go down to theater. And the babies were 11 weeks early, um, which is very early. Mm -hmm. It was like 28 or 29 weeks. Yeah. Um, and so I go down to theater. I had a couple of blood transfusions because I was quite ill as well. Oh my gosh. They're put into special care, and um, three days later was the first night we were allowed to hold Toby. Chloe, we still weren't allowed to hold, but Toby, we were allowed to hold. Stephen had been in a rant that day and had gone back to Northampton to get stuff. I'd had to be transferred to Luton, by the way, because of the premature birth. Mm. And I, by this point, I'd got used to this yo-yoing. I'm leaving, I'm coming back, I'm leaving. That was another tactic constantly. He was leaving. He'd pack his bags, go, come back again an hour later. And mm. my mum used to call him the boomerang because he'd do it so often. Yeah. And uh, again, to keep me on edge emotionally. Um, so he did that. He came back that evening. We go down to hold Toby. He wheeled me downstairs in a wheelchair. Um, I held Toby and he refused to hold him. He refused to be in a photograph with him. No, it was all very strange. Mm. And I thought, he's nervous that something's going to happen to the babies, which I understand. Mm -hmm. Tried to talk to him about it when we got back to the room. He was just sat on his phone, ignoring me. Um, and I said, you know, why wouldn't you hold Toby? Is You know, what's going on? And he gradually just started turning it into, it's your fault they were born early. Um, you need to get Jack seen to, he was six years old at the time. He's got mental health issues. Um, he had just started on me and my family and the kids. Wow. And I was so exhausted by this point. Bear in mind, I'd been in hospital two weeks, yeah. 10 days in labor. I was on morphine and all pethidine and all sorts of things. I was like rattling around. And I just said, look, I'm too tired for this now. I can't do it. I need you to go because I just need to rest. I've got two babies that need me downstairs yeah. and I can't do this now. And he said, well, I'm not leaving because I love you. And he just went to carry on. And I said, look, if you don't go, I'm going to ask someone to come and ask you to leave because I need to rest. Mm -hmm. At that point, he just said nothing. So I went to turn around so I could go to the bathroom, at which point I heard him shout no. And I felt him drag me back by my arm, with my arm above my head. He slapped me across the face and then dragged me across the bed and it nearly ripped my C-section open. Oh, gosh. Um, he then stood above me with my arm above my head and just pummeled into my head like a cushion over and over. And Do you remember what I just, was going through your mind at that time? Yeah, I thought, it's so strange because it's I've never been punched in the face before. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, I can feel this, but it didn't hurt. It was heavy. Yeah. And I remember it being very quick, but at the same time in slow motion. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds very strange, but it's just like this weird like loss of time. Mm -hmm. And I felt myself almost black out. And I thought, if I don't get up to the other end of the bed, he's going to kill me. Because he just lost it. So I somehow, and I don't remember how, got to the top of the bed and tried to clamber for the alarm. I was in my own room next to the nurse's station. Um, I wasn't even aware of any sound at that point. It was like everything just went mute. Yeah. The next thing I remember is him being up near my throat and the nurse walking in. Mm -hmm. And what had basically happened, it turned out, was they'd heard screaming, but they thought someone was in labor. And mm -hmm. because I'd already given birth, they didn't come to me first. Mm -hmm. They went past my room and came back to me. Yeah. So they walked in, he just shooed the nurse towards me. He walked around the bed, picked up his bag, walked back around the bed, went outside the doors, just waited for the elevator to go down calm as anything 
And in the meantime, that's when the sound came back and I was screaming and they're saying to me, what happened? What did he do? And I'm saying, it's him. And then I said, the babies, what's he going to do to the babies? I'm thinking he's going to go and unplug them or something. Mm -hmm. um, so they sent security down. I could barely speak because he'd broken my, he'd hit me on this side of the face, but my jaw had broken this side. Mm -hmm. My lips were split. I had a lump the size of a tangerine. I had bruises all down my neck and my chest. And um, as I said, he'd nearly pulled the stitches apart in my stomach, so I couldn't really move properly. And that was the first physical attack on me. <sighs> my gosh. Yeah. Was there others? Yes. Um, he, after leaving the hospital, he phoned the police and said, you need to come and arrest me. I've attacked my wife, uh, which in itself is bizarre, I think. Mm -hmm. um, very he strange that up. he, um, a very strange that he contacted the police. Yeah, not what most people who do that do. Um, he took himself back to his mum's address, gave them the address and waited to be arrested. Um, he pled guilty. He took himself to anger management once he was put on bail was told he didn't need anger management, um, just prepared himself that he was probably going to go to prison. And in the meantime, I now had my older boys with my parents in Essex. I couldn't drive because I just had the C-section. I was put on a liquid-only diet for six weeks, yeah. and I was trying to breastfeed two babies who were in special care. So I'm now in Luton. My business was in Northampton. My other children were in Essex, and all of this overnight, my life fell apart. Yeah. And... So I had to give up my business um, because I couldn't operate it without him there and without me there. Mm. Um, I had no income. I was trying to figure out once the babies were transferred, how I was going to manage getting without driving from Northampton to Kettering on the bus every day or with a cab. Mm. He was then allowed access to the babies when they went to Kettering Hospital. Um, despite the, was... despite the what he had done, were, were you okay yeah. with him seeing the babies, or did you just not have a say in the I matter? I didn't have a thought. The court granted that he couldn't be there when I was there, but he could be there to see them. Okay. Um, by all accounts, I believe he acted like the upstanding citizen in front of the nurses, so they gave him a glowing report to take to court. Mm -hmm. um, the nurses who had been in the labor board all said to me the morning after the attack of all the dads on the ward we didn't think it would be him mm. we couldn't believe it yeah. and of course that's exactly the point is that he didn't come across mm -hmm. as, as this person he didn't yeah. come across that way to me he didn't come across that way to anyone else mm -hmm. um, was he very charming to people who would meet him yeah yeah, and he was very eloquent, and mm -hmm. he obviously, you know, he was he had a, an impressive history, and um, he would talk about lots of different things, and he was engaging, and and then just suddenly, it was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah. There, but I had started already seeing Mr. Hyde at home. Um, yeah. It all went through court. The babies were still in special care, and I was told I wouldn't have to speak at the hearing because he'd pled guilty. In the meantime, he had been contacting me with all the apologies. Please just let me see you to apologize. And I remember at the time thinking, I'm not allowed to see him. Well, he's not allowed to see me, he's on bail conditions. But I hadn't decided to do this to him. And I was in love with this person and I just had two babies and everything was up in the air. And I wanted to believe that he was sorry. And I wanted to believe that he'd gone to the police because he was sorry. Mm -hmm. and that he'd gone to the hospital because he knew something needed to change. Mm -hmm. Of course, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. He moved back home. The next few months, he behaved to some extent. He was given a suspended sentence, um, was convicted of GBH against me. Yeah. Um, but he moved home, and social services asked him to sign a letter to say he wouldn't attack me again, which, of course, he signed because it wasn't going to stop him if that's what he was going to do yeah. um i then fell pregnant with rosie and when i was heavily pregnant the strange behavior started again pregnancy was definitely a trigger for him and it is in many cases um not that he was completely normal without that but it definitely made things worse yeah um and then when i had rosie within the space of a few weeks there were several attacks um on my birthday, he attacked me, ripped my clothes off me in the hallway because I'd laughed on the phone to Charlie's dad while he was saying happy birthday and telling me something Charlie had done at school. 
ripped all my clothes off me, walked around me like a tiger around his prey, telling me, you're a whore, you're a slut, you're this, you're that, the other. He chased me out of my house with a knife in his hand and then dragged me back inside and locked me in the conservatory oh um, while I had all five children in the house. He then, in front of his parents, lost... Because I tried to explain to them what was going on because I was 